You're listening to the Cynic Radio Podcast. Now, your hosts, Igri and Cynic. And you are listening to the one, the only, the Cynic Radio Podcast. And I'm your host, Cynic. And joining me, as always, the most prepared tag team of co-hosts a guy could ever ask for, Igri and Ryan. And on this week's show, listen, I know I say we have a jam-packed show a lot, but this week I mean it. It's going to make the rest of them seem like a blatant lie. Because on this week's jammed-packed show, the word is out. AMC has gone all in on this season of Fear the Walking Dead. Did it pay off? We also waited over a year for the carnage, the questions, Westworld is back. And it's back with a vengeance as we review season two episode one journey into the night we also do a little bit of really and what's up for you because we are the cynic radio podcast like listen subscribe most importantly we hope you enjoy the show this is our first look at fear of the walking dead mostly because we felt like most of the other fans did that the first three seasons were a bit underwhelming so i was happy when they found out that rather than let it fail amc brought in a team of strong actors to build on what was already there and what already worked about the show so this week we get to take a look at episode one and two what's your story and another day on the diamond Morgan's journey. After being recruited by all three communities, Morgan proves Rick wrong. He can hide as well as run. Insert hilarious Forrest Gump meme now. Ryan, let's talk about Morgan's journey. I mean, it covered an uh, impressive five states and up to 1,500 miles. Do you think the show handled it appropriately? And was it believable? I mean, would you have liked to see more of it? Uh, I yeah, I would like to have seen his journey. That's, I mean, when you consider you, you can't go, a, you know, five blocks in the Walking Dead universe without crazy shit happening. I kind of, you know, you know, how does he just get, you know, he, how does he travel five states um, on foot, you know, with with no excitement? So I would like to see more of the journey. Um, you know, at, at the same time, now to contradict myself, um, he was in such a, a sad mental state at the end of the Walking Dead. Um, that maybe he needed that time to start to kind of mentally recover. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would like to see some aspects of his journey. Um, but at the same time, maybe, you know, maybe that was kind of what he needed in order to, to allow himself to integrate with another community again. Maybe a big jug of pudding. <laughs> If big jug of pudding would have solved it all. Cool down time probably does help. It wasn't as much people, but as much as he cared about the people around him. You know, his big line in the episode was, I lose people and then I lose myself. I think in order for him to lose himself, he'd have to care about the people around him. So being around a new cast of characters might be advantageous to his mental health. A 1,500 mile journey is pretty impressive, even without the zombie apocalypse going on. If you're doing it mostly by foot and randomly taking cars here or there when you can find transportation. I was pretty impressed with that. I thought they handled it well. I would have liked to see more of it. I mean, Lenny James fascinates me. He's one of my favorite actors of all time. So I would have really done a whole season of Morgan going from one show to the other and been just as happy. IG, Lenny James is an extremely accomplished actor. What do you think spurred the switch from the highest rated TV show to one that frankly is underperformed the last few seasons? I mean, it's kind of like leaving the Yankees or the Golden State Warriors or the New England Patriots and going to a lesser team as a free agent. Well, I think, you know, they're looking at AMC as the team versus each individual show. And if they can basically uh, shift his playing position from Walking Dead to Fear the Walking Dead, they're hoping that's going to draw some some more fans that way. And he does have the power to do so. I mean, he's, he's a great actor. He's got a great role. The role has been intriguing for years. So I think he's got a good shot of being able to pull a bunch of people over just to watch, just to see what's going on. Now, that being said, maybe even get people going and getting on demand, watching a bunch of old episodes. And, of course, they're offering their AMC premiere thing now. So maybe a bunch of people are like, hell, I'll give them an extra five dollars a month so I can catch up on this without any commercials. I mean, it's it's more, I guess, greedy side says it's a money grab, but it's it's a smart one because what they're doing is they, they realize they've got a huge amount of star power on one show. And very little on the other show, at least thus far. Like the shows on Fear are great. The stars do a good job, but they're not drawing the people. I mean, even when we were at Walker Stalker, they had a bunch of people from Fear there. And you could walk up anytime you felt like it and talk to them because there was no line. So if you can pull some of that line over just by moving a character, it's just simple ratings. We can get some by moving 
Morgan from Walking Dead to Fear. I always feel bad for those people whenever I see that at these cons. I mean, you, sometimes you do a disservice to some of these people from these shows like the Ash vs. Evil Dead, which unfortunately just got canceled. Their lines were sparse the whole weekend of Atlanta Walker Stalker. And I understand you want to give people you know, variety in who you're going to see or who they choose to stand in line for. But sometimes I don't think they necessarily pick the shows in the best possible way to you know, Lost is a good show to pair it off with. It seemed like Sons of Anarchy was fear from time to time their lines would pick up. But sometimes I think that they they pick really sh- shows that have nothing to do with The Walking Dead. And these fans are Walking Dead centric. I mean, we see it when the season ends. Our podcast numbers definitely drop because The Walking Dead is what brings people in. Along the way, Morgan avoids everyone with just a slight encounter with a sick loner injured and actively dying in his car. He also encounters a hilarious gunslinging cowboy who's extremely chatty named John Dory. John hasn't spoken to anybody in over a year, but forms an instant bond with Morgan. Playing John is a pretty great actor named Garrett Dillon Hunt. Ryan is a trash-talking, quick-witted, hilarious cowboy, a more unique and fleshed-out character. Is this exactly what a show like this needs? Yeah, the, it gives a different feel um in this sh- in this world um for either show i think we've, we've seen a character like that so yeah definitely having kind of a du- gunslinger who is quick i mean obviously we have, we've had quippy with uh with negan but in this case it's it definitely gives a fresh feel and uh, you know genuinely unique character which maybe we haven't gotten something kind of that genuinely unique in in a few years i looked at him like a cross between negan eugene and king ezekiel but he's like a western kind of that he speaks in such a way that it's not D D, but it's like old west which is kind of hilarious in itself and then hick like but he's like so friendly hick like and i i like that about him and garrett delahunt anybody that hasn't watched raising hope needs to go do so as soon as they can because he is reason alone to watch raising hope i mean the show itself is great all the way around but garrett delahunt in that show is amazing and he plays an affable fool in that show but he is a really well accomplished actor and he does a great job in this role too. And so he's another reason that I myself would watch fear because Garrett Delahunt is great. Oh, he's a two way player for sure. I mean, he's great in raising hope, but then he was great in the first couple episodes of Deadwood. He's, he's one of those actors. He reminds me a lot of Walton Roggins who just makes everything he's in. The the second he shows up like, Oh, this guy's in it. You know, it's going to be good. That was a big get for them. He's done TV before. I mean, the majority of his uh, career has been TV, but he's done some powerful stuff as far as the theater too. You can't go wrong when you're bringing in characters like that. I love his makeup. I love his background. I love his wit. A gunslinger during the zombie apocalypse is an awesome idea. After some hijinks with the locals and getting themselves captured, they are saved by Athea. She is a female reporter with an armored Ave TV, which basically is a tank rigged with Walter White-like machine guns. IG, mysterious, resourceful. Athena is played by Maggie Grace from Lost. Does she come across as... Somebody that's in need of saving. Have we seen a stronger or more capable woman written on any of these shows? She was pretty strong. And, you know, people are in need of saving in different ways sometimes. You know, not everybody needs a a physical save or even an emotional save. Sometimes you just need companionship and that's enough to save somebody. And I think the one thing she's missing is steady companionship. But that RV is really impressive. When you when you have that flap open panel, it was like it kind of made me think of the old Spy Hunter video game where all of a sudden it's like, oh, machine guns and oil slick and smoke screen. I'm like, it was it was kind of neat. And they were like automated and just mowing down walkers. It was really, really cool. I lose people and then I lose myself. Athea interviews both John and Morgan as the price is saving them. Ryan, did you kind of get a kick out of Morgan telling his new friends about his old friends and about Shiva and the king? I mean, did it really feel like the worlds collided in that moment? Yeah, it did. But it was kind of it's. It's so soon after that, I don't know, like it weirdly took me out of it. Like I I kind of almost needed some distance. I think that's the, that's the biggest problem with maybe the, the crossover that I have is that they, that it happened so fast that we didn't really, like we didn't have, we didn't get time to miss Morgan because he was literally, you know, within an hour of, of exiting The Walking Dead, he's on Fear the Walking Dead and almost would have been nice to like have some distance before we have him kind of sharing 
you know, just in this world, it's just it's, it's like disjointed. Something doesn't feel feel right. But but yeah, it is kind of cool to to see them start to bring things together. But I, I still think that now that the timelines are closer, we're going to get a legit real crossover. Because I mean, yeah, this is kind of a crossover, but it really isn't a crossover. It's just one character jumping ship to another show. I think we'll down the road, is get, you know, get a real crossover. And that's when I'll get the real kind of crossover feels. I liked it because it's like you came from someplace where a dune owned a tagger. I mean, people are, are struggling to survive. They're struggling to have food and water and stay alive. And this guy has a pet tagger and he calls himself a king. That would be amazing in any story setting. So I thought that was kind of cool. I, I, Wish they would have done a little bit more of that, and I hope they do down the road. I agree with you, Ryan. I think that we are headed towards a full crossover at some point. Who knows who ends up in Texas and who ends up in uh, Georgia, or I guess Virginia now. I enjoyed it quite a bit. What did you think, Egg? Yeah, well, I'm with Ryan where I think it was too soon. I think he needed to remain a little more mysterious. Like The amount of information he was giving out right away, I think, was unlike Morgan. Uh, I think it was written off character and that's where it threw me off because Morgan isn't as freewheeling with information as they put him in that moment. So I was a little disappointed. I liked the stories and that's, it's fun to watch him like react to somebody owning a tiger, but it, it just, it put me off. Like maybe they have no crossover in writers between fear and the walking dead and, Maybe they need some because you need to know how to write Morgan like Morgan. And so that put me off a little bit that way. I mean, it was fun. I'll give it that. I enjoyed it. But it did put me out because I didn't think that it was Morgan light. After seeing both episodes, this one and the one they showed last night, uh, you know, another day on the diamond. It really should have been a two-parter, don't you think? I mean, they really tied them together. Yeah, they they tied them together. And like, you know, in this one, though, we didn't get to see the one last night in, in the Diamond. We didn't get to see Morgan like almost Not- at all. And, and it's aren't I right? I just watched it. I didn't see Morgan in it anywhere. In, uh, well, he was in the the last about minute or two of it because what they yeah, did was he, he was they jumped back was, to current day. Yeah, and but I mean, there's a lot of things that are going on in it that. I think it, they should have flipped them, right? They should have pushed the other side up and then merged that way. And that might have done better to keep people entranced. Like flip back to current day, show it just the way they did, but then show last week's episode next week. I think that might have done more for the suspense of Morgan in the show. Uh, and that's just me. And, you know, I'm not a showrunner by any means. I just think that it might have worked better. And and even one week separated and him telling stories about Shiva and King Ezekiel and their fight with the saviors and everything, I think that might have played better a, a week separated. Well, I think they wanted to connect the, the two shows. They wanted the rub from Walking Dead original to Fear the Walking Dead. I mean, we're pushing a character over. I understand why they did the Worlds Collide thing, and I, I think it worked. However, I felt like this episode was a two-parter. I really think that they should have been showed concurrently and one right after the other because they just fit together so well. It was almost like one episode because uh, you, you started in one place and then you ended up back right in the exact same place that the first episode had ended. I like the way it was done. I don't like the way that it was given to us. Morgan is injured and decides to stay with his new traveling companions till he heals. And they get ambushed by the main cast of the show. And that brings us to the next episode, Another Day on the Diamond. We finally get a look at the original cast as they're living on a minor league baseball field. You spend your whole life swimming upstream and yet to end up a patty. And Frankly, most salmon patties are just terrible. When we open the episode, uh, we get a great wake-up montage from the main cast. And Ryan, you're a New Yorker. What would be your ideal and reasonable base during the zombie apocalypse? I mean, what is the safest place you could think of to hold up if this was going down? Uh, I mean, I'm in New York. So, I mean, there are any number of skyscrapers. I'm going to assume that, you know, during the zombie apocalypse, you can, you know, if you're on the even the 20th floor of a building. I mean, how are they going to get to you? Assuming they're not littered, you know, within the building. So I feel like you you got any number of skyscrapers to, to climb on top of and, you know, kind of hole up there. What about you, AJ? Where would you hold (laughs) up? Baseball field. Nice. (laughs) USB stadium. (laughs) I don't know. A stadium really does. If you can clean it out, if you can get whatever's in there out, it really does any kind of stadium for that, for that, 
thing. There's all the all the access points are controlled, so you know exactly where anybody's going to get in. The rest of it is generally pretty well enforced, concrete, steel, and other materials, so nobody's going to just break through it, even if they ram it with cars and things like that. So you only have to limit access in very specific places. Uh, what they did by taking over a baseball field was ingenious. I mean, it it worked really, really well. Um, but that being said, I think um, if if I was going to look for a, a place that isn't a baseball field, just because you do need to come there with resources to make things happen, I, th- I think a Sam's Club is perfect. And I don't know that you have those in the city there. I'm pretty sure you don't. You have to go out a little ways to get into Walmart types situations. But Sam's Club is like Walmart on crack with like its own freezers and generators, anything you could need. They have a pharmacy and there's generally two doors at the front and one big door for the auto garage in the back. So big concrete building, easy to defend, and years worth of food for a small group of people. I mean, would you head on down to Target Field and lock yourself in? I mean, a baseball field is not the worst idea in the world. You have covering, you have dugouts, you have offices. I mean, you have a lot of space, and it looked like they were using some of that to farm and they had livestock. Would you seek out a baseball field, or would the Sam's Club be more uh, interesting to you? Because I would think that a Sam's Club would be picked over at that point. Well, unless you got there right away when this happened and just took it over i mean you're absolutely right but a baseball field for the longevity for the long haul so once you get past the initial whatever's going on if you can get a group of people to take that over because and especially when you get to the warmer climates like where they're at where you have year round that you can grow crops and things like that like here i mean there's six months a year you ain't growing anything now the six months you can you can grow a lot because the soil here is very very fertile but you, you're going to suffer in the winter. But there, I mean, you think about all the VIP suites and everything. So you have everybody can have their own room. I mean, because they've only got, what did they say, 47 people living there. So you can live together if you want, but there's got to be plenty of places between all the offices and training rooms and the VIP suites and everything else. There's got to be plenty for people to go live in so you're not tripping over each other. You know, if you have a spat with somebody, you don't necessarily have to cross paths because, you know, baseball field's a pretty big place. They left us at a cliffhanger as the dam exploded and everybody was floating downstream. They did it pretty slyly. They told us that about a year has passed, or at least a year since they've gotten there, that uh, over the PA, which I thought was a really cool way to do it. And we catch up with Madison, who's reassuring a young girl named Charlie that they're safe. Ryan, they are safe. I mean, they look happy. They look clean. They look safe. You and I both know how long is that going to last in The Walking Dead? I mean, you've got the perfect setup. Somebody's coming to take it, right? Yeah, there's the, that's kind of the, the name of the game. Is You know, nothing can be comfortable for too long so i think and and that's like the kiss of death you know whenever anybody says in any of these shows that things are good you you know they're not going it's not going to last so clearly um you know they have they seem to have a perfect setup but obviously that that's not going to last very long the team goes out looking for charlie's parents we get a really cool ingenious pitching machine uh baseball bomb combo to draw the walkers away which i thought was really fucking cool they go out on a run to save charlie's parents but nick won't come nick who is like Carl, we could never keep inside and was always roaming around out amongst the dead, won't go out. He said, I'm staying in here pretty soon. We won't ever need to go out there. IG, is it possible that he's suffering from some sort of post-traumatic effect from the the dam explosion and is running with the proctors? It's most likely that he's having some kind of post-traumatic stress that, you know, the, the things that happen outside those walls are prohibiting him from being able to go outside those walls. And should he go out, it would end in nothing but even worse things because he's not prepared to deal with any of them. I I think it's, you know, what the actual thing is called is anti-Carlism, right? Because, you know, Carl couldn't keep, couldn't stay in the house. And this guy's like, nope, I'm staying in. So it's anti-Carlism. I've, I've deemed the new the new word. Now, now, speaking of that, the most ingenious thing that you hit on was that baseball that they, they were making little baseball bombs. How come nobody's making anything near that cool on The Walking Dead? Like nobody's got any kind of cool, like just simple, easy, make from what you've got tech. And that's exactly what this is. They just dump some gunpowder or something into a baseball, put a fuse on it and launch it out of a pitching machine. It blows up out. 100 yards away and all the walkers turn and go that way 
so smart. I, I was that moment was awesome as far as I'm concerned. That was great to watch. So the team goes out to look for Charlie's parents, and they get to the town, and it's picked over. But there's those markers from last week. I mean, they're popping up again. There doesn't seem to be any dead. There doesn't seem to be any alive. Everything is just a ghost town. When they meet Naomi, played by Jenna Elfman, she's a nurse, and she seems to be handwritten to be a friend of Madison. And then Madison's sheer leap of stupidity. Brian. You've now survived almost two years of the zombie apocalypse. Are you diving down a dark hole to save a stranger who just had a gun to your head? No. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, interesting because you think I, I nitpick uh, The Walking Dead so much, you'd think I'd, I'd get angry at this moment too. But uh, it, maybe it's just her character and that, and that I kind of there's an expectation of that to an extent. And I guess for some people there's like an override switch and that kind of selfless act overrides the rat, you know, the kind of logic of, yeah, you just had a gun to my head I'll let you die. And so, you know, clearly that was the case with her, but you know, I'm not doing it, <laughs> but, but some people are, are better human beings than I am. How about you, IG? Are you sorry about you, Naomi? And you just let her go. <laughs> I'd, I'd have turned around to my other friends there and I said, well, that one's gone. Let's go back home, you know, go find the rest of her beanie beans and weenies and we'll have a little snack on our way out of here no i'm no matter even if i know that she's a nurse even if i know she's a good person maybe even if she's an acquaintance now a good friend maybe but like an acquaintance or anything short of that you're done see you later i don't even care like if it's just water down there, like, and she proves she's got a flashlight. Look, there's nothing else down here. And be like, well, I uh, hope you can swim or it rains a lot and raises a level because we're not coming in after you. Bye. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be diving down there either, especially since, you know, with the way it was open, the way it was set up, that somebody was leading walkers to fall down in there. And especially when you find out that it's oil down there, I I just don't think I'm going to do it. You're, you're going down the hole. I'm not saving you. They return safely only to be surrounded by what I like to call the polite saviors and then we find out that charlie was a, uh, a traitor and then we get to meet their leader mel ig did you see the charlie swerve coming and are the vultures and mel just another human threat to you or do they intrigue you in some way i didn't see the swerve coming at least not right away i thought it was just kind of a lone survivor out there like i didn't think she had any part in anything it was because she looked kind of haggard and i mean i kind of believed that she could have been just kind of pulling the uh pulling the Morgan and moving around the country on her own, trying to find a way to just survive. Um, but the vultures intrigue me. Uh, I don't think they're just another group of bad guys. I think there might be something more. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold out hope that they don't go just, I, I I'm hoping that one of these times, rather than going just straight, like, you know, that's the bad guy. I, I want to see more like in Spider-Man homecoming, because I could, sympathize with the vulture in that movie because it made sense why he was doing that stuff. And I I'd like to see something that gives you a little bit of, well, they might be right too. Yeah. Just not a straight up bad guy, but a gray, but I think we might've done that with Negan. I think they pushed a little too hard for Negan to be gray and it kind of muddies the water because then you've got people rooting for both teams. So they pushed hard for him to be gray later. You know, and that's the problem is that initially like he was all the way, all the way bad guy. And then they, they tried to pull back on that and not that it didn't work, but it was, it was, it just wasn't as believable at that point. Cause you can't have a guy doing the things Negan does and explain it two years later. Like if he'd explained it a week later, or if he'd explained it in the RV right after he bashed somebody's skull in to Rick, I get it. All right. Then you have gray and you're showing it right away, but they didn't start turning gray until like two years after. And, and that's the problem with that. Yeah. Just like Ryan just said, retconning it. You can't, you can't retcon it like that. So if they start gray and then end up a different direction, that's perfectly fine, but you can't go the other way. Yeah. And I feel like narr like kind of the narratively, the, the story, like Negan was made, Negan was presented as evil and that was the that was the character he was he was the big bad the group was bad they were evil and he was only made gray to serve Rick's story, really. Like if you think about it, like we, you know, like you said, like we, you know, it, it was only after the fact, and it was really just done in service of of Rick's story and of Rick's kind of own redemption. And so, yeah, we haven't really 
gotten the real opportunity to see a gray, you know, two groups that are on the right side or, you know, two like baby faces, you know, go up against one at one another. It's always been, you know, baby face versus heel only, you know, in Negan's case, he was kind of given a little bit of a backstory and explanation, but yeah, we haven't really seen in either of these shows, like two groups that are at odds with each other, but that all both seem to be, uh, you know, on the right side. I like the way that they rounded up the the walkers. I, it's it's clean. I'm not quite sure what the maps or the calling cards they're leaving means. Maybe they're showing Morgan how you actually clear something because they did a great job in that town. There's nothing around. They have a, a very efficient force as far as taking the dead out. We'll see how they do against the living. But uh, I liked Mel. I liked his cool and calm demeanor. I liked the fact that he didn't threaten. And he also offered Madison and company a chance to join them. He come be with us. And maybe we will down the road get some some background on who they were and where they came from and why they're doing what they're doing. And I, I would prefer them rather than just be the evil stereotypical bad guy to be a little gray. Now, The Walking Dead, I would have respected that a lot more if we didn't make Negan a likable bad guy, if he would have got off made his big entrance, but he still threw these annoying, funny quips out. I I think it would have worked better. They wanted Jeffrey Dean Morgan over with the audience for some reason. They pushed hard to make that happen, and and now he is. And now you have a show divided, and I think that's really muddy in the waters as far as the way people see the show. IG, we cut back to now. We know it was a year from then, but we have no idea when it was at the, the end of episode one and at the end of episode two. But... Morgan and company are surrounded by a more dirty, battle-hardened group led by Strand, led by Alicia. How much time do you think has elapsed? And what do you think happened? Your thoughts on your rating of the episode? Well, I think they've been through some stuff. And I, I hope it, I honestly hope it was a different group than these vultures. I really do. I hope something else happened. Um, some other group came by and started some things and they got in a war or they got in a battle and they had to escape and... There's a multitude of things that could have happened to got them where they are currently. Um, but pairing all these people together, honestly, like just from the little I've seen, because we know Morgan, we know what we're working with there. Garrett Delahunt could be amazing because it seems like, you know, he's got really, really quick draw pistols and things like that. He's a true Western, you know, sharpshooter. He can make things happen. I think I think that they could really end up in some very interesting places. And I think or at least I hope that this all like pushes this like very quickly into a story like in there. There needs to be an arc that's going to happen at least at least a few episode arc, if not for the rest of the season. I, I really like it. And you know what? Like I said before, Garrett Delahunt is amazing. His introduction in this season has renewed my hope in Fear the Walking Dead. Uh, I was coming along and I I really thought it was going to be great because Morgan was coming. Garrett Delahunt is, to me, the the saving grace that is going to pull this along because we know what we're getting with Morgan. Everyone ex- knows what to expect with him. I didn't even know Garrett Delahunt was coming until I watched the episode and so I'm excited. So these two episodes, uh, I liked the second better than the first. Uh, I liked the first. Putting them together because, like you said, that should have been kind of a two-parter. Just put them together. I think I'm going to give them a seven and a half. Uh, it's a good start. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, but I think they had to build some characters in this, and that takes some a little bit of time. And it, it's just it's set up. And you need to do some setup, bringing new characters in and things like that. So I'm going to give it a seven and a half. When you're building something, all the pieces matter if you want it to to come together right. And these two stories just, they melded together so well. They just worked. I mean, What's Your Story and Another Day on the Diamond just worked. They fit together. AMC is now all in on a show that I thought was just going to frankly go away. But these new chapters... It's just a new chapter in the show. It's almost like a different show now. I'm a huge fan of Kim and Coleman who play Madison and Strand, but the show was missing something, and I think they found it. I used to tease it about it was a show of unlikable characters, and at their core, they really were. They were self-interested. I mean, they cared about their family, but they made selfish choices at every turn. So 
we bring in a lot of strong actors, likable actors, and interesting characters to fill out the roster. I think the show's in a better spot at this point than it's ever been. The vultures definitely look like a threat, and they frankly understand Walker management. I give the combined episode an eight. Miss out on that latest viral video? Didn't see the most recent trailer for the next movie coming out? In the dark about what the biggest song in America is? We've got you covered. Every week we scour the internet and look for the latest and greatest. This is What's Up. What's Up for me this week is A Quiet Place. Uh, It's been out for a few weeks now and I had a chance to see it um, this past weekend. And it really is a, a great movie. Probably one of the best movies I've seen this year. Um, you know, it takes a gimmick of of um, kind of this family that has to be you know the, silent in order to avoid these monsters and uses it really incredibly. Um, you know, the way that they're able to use noise to build tension and you know create an atmosphere. It's really unique and, and a way of story, a storytelling method that I really I don't think I've ever seen. And it was done in a way that really produced one of the again, one of the most tense movie experiences really I've ever had and easily, you know, just terrifying tense when it needed to be, um, on the edge of your seat. And it's a movie that really should be seen in a theater because the silence kind of extends itself, not only to the movie, but to, to the people next to you, you know, you can, you can hear people chewing popcorn at times and, uh, it is this level of insecurity that kind of adds to the tension of the movie. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, you know, highly, highly recommended, um, go see a quiet place. So again, what's up for me is a quiet place. What's up for me this week? Well, it's Mr. James Shaw Jr. And if you don't know who this guy is, you should. He's the gentleman who stopped the mass shooting at the Waffle House in Tennessee. After being grazed in the arm by a bullet, Mr. Shaw hid, waited for the gunman to reload, rushed him, and wrestled the gun away from the naked lunatic, causing him to flee. Now, don't call James a hero, because admittedly, he was, act- he was acting in self-preservation when he acted. Sorry to tell you this, James, you are a hero. You saved countless numbers of lives inside the restaurant and out. Who knows where this guy was headed next? Burned from the muzzle, James didn't wait to be saved. He acted. And it's my belief, as citizens, this is simply what we're going to have to do. So for me this week, James Shaw, your what's up? What's up for me this week is Anaheim Angels player Shohai Otani. Many are looking at this guy like he's the latest incarnation of Babe Ruth, which rings very true because he pitches, he plays in the field, and he's probably one of the fastest guys in Major League Baseball. But it doesn't end there. I mean, the guy is brand new to baseball here in America. He's played in Japan for a few years before this, but he's brand new to American baseball. And he hits for power. He's hitting already over 300. He is one of three pitchers this year to throw a fastball at over 100 miles an hour. The guy's got it all. And in a world where people are kept on rosters because they hit well against left-handers on Tuesdays that also occur under a full moon, a guy that can literally do it all is amazing. Shohai Otani, your what's up? I'm so excited to bring this one to you because after production delays, story delays, one of the most complex, interesting, well-acted shows on TV, Westworld returns for season two, basically out of nowhere. And this is our overview, season two, episode one, A Journey in the Night. Season two picks up in the aftermath of where season one left off with two reoccurring themes, the first being what is real. Bernard tells Dolores, I'm afraid of what you might become and what she may become indeed. Is it easier taking a high dive into the Westworld pool now knowing that we're looking at multiple timelines and multiple phases of people's lives? Yes and no. I I think, you know, that was part of the mystery and part that we just didn't quite know or weren't quite aware. I think now that we are it almost lends itself to a bit of a fear of mine, which you know becomes almost like a storytelling trope where you you you're kind you have a mystery and you go from past to present to past to present to kind of to to form the mystery and and it works well sometimes it doesn't work so well at others. I think what was so brilliant about you know last season was that we just didn't know. So you know as far as how the story is going to be told, you know how do we need that 
do we need the different timelines for this story to be told well? And so that's my only little, I mean, I thought, you know, I, I really love the show and, and love the episode, but just a little fear of mine is I, I don't want to get kind of bogged down in that type of storytelling where we just keep going back and forth for the sake of it, instead of just giving a, a really strong story that's driven, you know, w- with the clear kind of narrative w- with the mysteries. Cause that, you know, that's one of the things that works well with it. But again, it's just, I don't want to get bogged down in that if it's not necessary. What I found interesting is there was a lot of callbacks to Dolores in my mind being the Terminator as she mowed down both guest and host. She was right. Not all of us deserve to make it from the Valley of the Beyond. IG, what were your thoughts on the visuals of Dolores, basically with her no fucks given attitude, shooting hosts and hanging people? And was it frankly terrifying? It was extremely terrifying because uh, she showed nothing while doing it like facial expression didn't change most of the time it was stone-faced killing and i would imagine that even as an actor that has to be difficult to do i mean either you're having fun because you're a crazy person or it's still got to cringe a little bit i wonder how many takes it took to get her to not go ah it was really impressive It was a really terrifying, but it was really fun to watch. It was because a friend of mine wouldn't watch the show because she thought that basically it was just a vehicle to to do violence to Dolores. Like, we're just going to see this nice girl abused over and over and over again. And I told her, I'm like, you've got to see where this goes because they basically get their comeuppance. I mean, she uh, she turns the table. It takes a while to get there. But once she's had enough, uh, she's had enough indeed. Have you ever questioned the nature of your reality? Ryan, do you think she's acting on her own free will? Or do you think this, this is Dr. Ford's work and play? Is he still pulling the puppet string? You know, that's a great question. I I tend to think she's acting on her own free will only because it seemed like you know, that was Dr. Ford's end goal. Like that was what he he wanted. So, you know, unless they're pulling the wool over our eyes, which which would be frustrating, you know, as a viewer, you know, I want to believe that that we were honestly given insight into what he he wanted from this world and from Dolores. So so I do think she's she's acting on her own free will. But then, you know, I mean, then you can get into all kinds of philosophical discussions about whether or not any of us is really acting on our own free will. And maybe there's you know, it is just still does come down to programming. But, you know, but to put it simply, I do think I, I'd like to think it is her own free will. And, and unless they have a real good reason for it not be for Ford not wanting it that way, you know, I'm going to stick with that for now. Well, now if Ford wanted it that way. Wouldn't you be saying that that there is a little bit of pulling puppet strings because that's probably code that he had written to put into them to allow this to to go that way, even if it's code to allow decision making based upon different circumstances. That's still puppet stringing to to ai type creatures right you know that's that's what these are they're they're ai now they're learning ai but they're still ai so if you put limitations on the ai then it's going to hit that wall and stop because so there had to be code written i would think that allows this to happen yeah i mean it's, it's like he's playing god you know so so clearly he's he is pro you know they're they're still robots you're right like they're still not humans um they've they, and, and all of it comes down to their programming but to the extent that you know he can you can you can try to you know there's there's a way to try to program you know free will into it and so yeah obviously he's still pulling puppet strings because he he is creating a b you know a, a being that's sentient and that has free will so he he is pulling the puppet strings but but that's the extent of it that he has the the idea but but he needs to you know build into her the the ability to make those choices so so yeah you're right i mean you know he he's certainly still the puppet master it's just a matter of of whether or not he he's gone as far as to write the story or he's allowing her to to create the story and I'd like to think that he's allowing her to create the story. My only problem with that is Maeve also believes that she's working on her own free will and it's all code. That kind of mucks the waters for me a little bit where I'm like, it was this written for Dolores or has she evolved to the point where she's thinking for herself? Because Maeve said the same thing and Bernard shot that down in the finale last year. He was like, all this stuff has been pre-written for you. And I believe the only time she broke character or broke storyline was when she got off the train and came back because I think somebody wanted her to smuggle something out of the park. IG, 
This doesn't look like anything to me at all. As a parent, have you not seen this over and over again? Rather than guide your child through life, parents tend to force their children with an iron fist who they want them to be and what they want them to do when they grow up. And then it ultimately blows up in their face. I mean, can you draw a parallel between the hosts and children? Because we push and push and push for them to go in the direction we want. And when they finally decide who they are, it's a completely different story. And, you know, I guess it's happened with a lot of us. I think most of us, most of our parents are like lawyers and doctors and things like that. And obviously here we are doing a podcast. You know, the thing is, is, yeah, you're going to try and mold and mold and mold, but they're still going to end up being what they're going to end up being. And, and some of that might be just, you know, hardwired into them that no matter what you did as a parent, that's going to go that way. But honestly, nobody knows because, I mean, nature versus nurture has shown different results and different people. You know, like you could have two children nurtured by the same parents the same way and that they end up living completely separate lives. And one could be a crackhead and the other one could be like a, the person that solves cancer. Who knows? Right. But what it show, the, I see a common theme here where all of these children, all the hosts that they created, somehow all decided that they're just not going to play by whatever game they were supposed to play anymore. And that is intriguing to me that they all went kind of that direction. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I've seen children that rebel against their parents once they gain age or money or something that they can go ahead and, and do as they wish, I guess, as is a good way to put it. But I, it doesn't always end as well as those people think it's going to. Um, I, I've seen it with my own adult daughter who, like, thinks she's making the smartest decisions of all time, week in and week out, and then calls me when it fails and goes, well, I don't know what happened here. And should I tell her what happened, then she gets mad at me, which is hilarious. As the dinner party slaughter began, the man in black just stood there and smiled, shot, arm broken. He just stood there and smiled. He survived the night. He's the lone wolf. I mean, he's headed home. Ryan, isn't this what he wanted? The gloves are off. He fights off two attackers and kills them single-handedly. This is what he wanted, right? A game without rules? Yeah. No, He. It's. I mean, that's one of the cooler things of, of the end of last season and being in this is he's in his element. This is what he wanted. I think this is his, you know, I mean, that's life's work, but this, but his, it seems like his entire life has been pointing to this moment. Um, and I think he, you know, if he were to die in this world, you know, it would be a worthy death for him. I think he, you know, this is all he wants and you can see it and you can see the joy almost that he takes in, in being in this world now where the gloves are off and, and he can, you know, he, he he can make him you know if he makes a mistake he dies and and the reality is he's been training for 30 years for this so yeah i re- really intrigued by that storyline and to see where it goes and to see how he changes his own actions you know now that he can die now is it possible with all of this going on that really the biggest thing that's happening is all of this got rewritten just for him since he's been coming for 30 years, maybe that the, the all this killing and the hosts and the people and everything getting killed was all written to happen just for the man in black. I could see it going that way. That's some some crazy like that's HBO type stuff right there. That could happen. Well, he does kind of own the place. I mean, he has been coming there for 30 years. Most of us can't get a cake when we retire from work, but he's getting a, <laughs> a full party send off where everybody dies. IG, no one's in control. I mean, more carnage back at the control center. Everybody's dead. And it looks like they may have been attacked by a bear. I mean, there's tigers roaming around. There's bears rolling around. It's one thing to be attacked by angry cowboys and flesh-eating savages. But is it time to kick your shoes off and run when you start getting mauled by a fucking host of bears? What is this? I mean, <laughs> I, I understand that now they've shown us that there are many parks going on. But bears and tigers oh my there's i mean pretty soon we're gonna have like there there's gonna be the crossover right we just had walking dead and fear the walking dead we're gonna have westworld and game of thrones crossover we're gonna have dragons flying and and ice walkers and all kinds of other things happening because they've probably got a westworld camp full of game of thrones there's gotta be i know it's pot talk but wouldn't you just lose your mind if you find out that game of thrones is a park within westworld that would just be amazing. <laughs> that would just be nutty. And, they, and they've been in there playing that game for like three years. I'm like, first of all, like to get into something like that, because it's got to cost something to go to this camp, right? 
what would it cost to get immersed so deep that like you're you're, you're Cersei in Game of Thrones? What would that cost to do that? That that had to be, you know, like England. <laughs> I, I give you England to come in and play this game. Well, we've got a big cast, or at least what's left of the cast, and we get some pretty interesting pairings. First off, we'll look at uh, take a look at Dolores and Teddy. Teddy comes across to me is that one sober guy in a, in a bar full of drunk people. Ryan, did it look like Dolores and Teddy were on the same page or is she slightly manipulating him to push her game forward? Yeah, it seems like she's manipulating him. It's almost like she's reached, you know, a level of um, awareness and consciousness that I don't think anybody else or any, you know, any of the other hosts have, including Teddy. So it definitely seems like she's kind of stringing him along and he's kind of her loyal servant. But you see a clear... Even in the way they're acting, it's kind of acted. You see a clear difference in, you know, again, in the awareness and kind of almost sentience of, of the two. So, yeah, I definitely think she's she's kind of in the driver's seat there. And Teddy's, you know, again, all, you know, kind of along for the ride, you know, typical of his, of his kind of character um, and just James Madison characters in general. Um, but, you know, hopefully he gets uh, he's less of a loser <laughs> this time around. It, it just it hurts you to the core because everything you see him in, he's just kind of like yeah. a plain Jane milk toast, you know, almost cannon yeah. fodder. It's like, oh, shucks, Dolores. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, CBS's Survivor, where Dolores has made a alliance with Teddy <laughs> to the final two, and then she votes him out yeah. at four. It's like, oh, Teddy, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> IG, then we got Maeve, Hector, and uh, Lee Sizemore. How compelling do you is Maeve still looking for a daughter? Is it a good storyline? And do you like the pairing of Maeve and, and Hector? I like the pairing. I still like Maeve's character. I don't know if the just the finding of the daughter itself is compelling enough to keep it going. But the way she goes about everything she's doing is with such conviction and it's acted so well. And it just looks so good when they're doing it that, you know what? I can buy into it. I mean, it it's just is. I can buy into it. Maeve is not quite as compelling as Dolores, but she's not far behind. I, I she's well, she's another one that was saying the line right these violent delights you know she's another one that was using that line i like her and the the actress does a great job i well the thing is is with the exception of cyclops for the most part all of these guys are doing probably the best acting of their lives thus far I, i really can't say anything negative about how well all of this is acted because it is beautifully done. And th- that alone will keep me interested in whatever Maeve is doing. Because it's just, she's doing amazingly well. Whoever's writing and whoever's directing is doing such a great job with these characters that it I just can't turn away from it when it's on. Yeah, I, I really like the Ma- I, I like the performance so far. And I find it interesting. It's an interesting comparing her to Dolores. Because Dolores seems to be shedding her past like she seems to be kind of escaping from that past and becoming her own person and and kind of becoming again a a real sentient being while Maeve has kind of uh enhanced all of her you know attributes um but but she's internalizing everything more she's she wants to she she's she's reaching back into her past life as a as a host and and looking for her child and even though you you think kind of intellectually as smart as she is at this point she should know that the child really has no real connection to her she seems to be dipping further into herself and into her past where where Dolores you know seems to be the opposite where she's kind of escaping that um so it is interesting how you you have your kind of two lead um and, and really she got uh, probably more screen time than anybody so if you kind of maybe maybe bernard is up there with her but but um you know two of your three you know big leads um really having just a completely different um experiences but in in many you know in, in some ways kind of heading in the same direction well you brought up a good point too Ig. the acting is probably the best on tv you know game of thrones has the moments where i kind of cringe walking dead is full of moments when i cringe i mean at westworld they're all believable. They they they're all A-rate actors. They're all 
on the mark, everything they deliver. Maeve, just her delivery, her cadence. And I think, Ryan, I think she's searching for something that she sees as real. Dolores is beyond this game. Maeve has no interest in leaving this game. She wants to win it. And by winning it, by, I think by reclaiming her daughter or finding her daughter, I think it makes it real to her. Now, whether her daughter remembers her or not by the time she gets there, that's going to be another heartbreaking twist and turn that we'll, we'll find out. And maybe that'll set her on the path of Dolores. But I have a feeling that Dolores is, what do the kids say, on that next level shit? You know, she's she's looking to leave the game where Maeve wants to win it for herself. Then, Ryan, we get Bernard and Charlotte. How is it that nobody can tell that Bernard's a host? Not those creepy sentinel guards in the, the shack there, not the scanners. Is Ford that good that he was he's able to deceive everybody? Yeah, I think I, that's got to be it. I think that, you know, again, Ford's the creator of all of this, and Ford clearly built in you know, built in kind of fail safes into the system to, to, so that, for, you know, so that, um, Bernard is not found out unless he wanted it. So I think that's the only reason why. And I think we, you know, we're kind of been privy to, to Ford's genius, you know, throughout last season. Um, so I don't think it's unrealistic or unreasonable to expect that he was able to set something, you know, you know like the programming that, allows the um hosts to see humans as hosts now you know similarly he he must have you know set some kind of programming that allowed you know the hosts and the systems to to perceive um uh, bernard as um as human yeah i i like it a lot and and the fact that bernard is so self-aware as a host and and like pulled whatever brain fluid out of the the one dead one and injected it into himself to kind of restabilize himself because he was leaking fluid from his ear. That scene sold me. I mean that it was it was it was well done. It was beautifully shot and it was creepy all at the same time. But you know, this show. Like I see the things coming and it still surprises me with some of these things. And I just, I just love it. And Bernard is the epitome of, you know, walking both sides of the equation where is it programming? Is he just that self-aware? Who knows? Because we certainly don't yet. We don't know. Well, it seems like Charlotte is more set on self-preservation than anything. I mean, she's, she's willing to let everybody in the park die if she doesn't get this information. If she finds out that Bernard is a host, will she turn him in? Or if it'll save her ass, will she keep quiet to get her off the island, IG? Oh, she's all about herself. So if keeping quiet gets her saved, she'll keep quiet. If turning him in gets her saved, she'll turn him in. It's literally about what will save her butt. Now, that being said, I think that um, there may be some self-preservation in at least some of the hosts, Bernard being one of them, that he's not going to let himself just go willy nilly. If they know what he is and know what's going on, he's going to save himself. At least I see it going that way. And I could be wrong, but that's the way I see it going. So if she does find out, that might not be great for her at that moment. Well, we get a nice look at the background. A host freeze safe room, a creepy drones walling around, logging records of guest experiences and extracting DNA. Ryan, first Yahoo, then Google, now Facebook. And now we can't go anonymously have sex with a host and shoot them up without them collecting your DNA and your information uh, and taking your secrets. I mean, is nothing sacred anymore? It brings up, well, it brings up one of the interesting mysteries and I guess, uh, plot lines for this season is like, and, and, and you know, it's funny cause it's something that I didn't consider at all. And I, wa- I you know, watched the season, watched every episode a couple of times, read all the review sites and, and I don't know if I just missed it, but I never thought like, yeah, they totally should be, can and should be stealing stuff. They can bribe people. They can steal DNA. They can recreate people. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff they could do that it, it, with this information. That's terrifying. Like what fail, what protections are there against them doing st- something like that? So I think it does present, you know, some you know, potential for some interesting stories there. And, and yeah, it's like, you know, would you guys go to, would you guys go to Westworld or any of the worlds knowing that they could potentially be doing that? Or would you just do it and behave completely 100% as good as you could? Nah, they can do whatever they want. It's fine. All they're going <laughs> to they aren't going to ruin my credit. It's fine. 
Credit's already bad. Well, I mean, if you look at the terms of service just to use an iPhone, I can only imagine what they would be if you go to Westworld. They can do anything they want to you. Listen, I've stole both your identities, and I'm selling them on the dark web right now as we speak. Nothing sacred anymore, so you have nothing to worry about. IG, the extraction protocol has been suspended. They want the information hidden within Peter Abernathy. And they're willing to let everybody at the park die. What's going on here? What is it for its code? Is it something more? Is it the profiles of the guests? What are they looking to save in order for them to send the troops and rescue everybody? That's one of the things that I'm not sure what he's got. You know, I think maybe, you know, I, I would imagine whatever wireless and Bluetooth type technologies to make this stuff happen is well beyond whatever we've got now. Maybe Peter Abernathy is the central gathering hub for all the information. He's just out there. He's a host. He's doing things. But because he's moving around a little bit, all the information downloads into him. So maybe he's got everything. Maybe. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> he's important. And I want to know, you know, that's the the one problem. And it's not really a problem because it keeps people watching is that, you know, a lot of especially HBO series are slow burns, right? But they're burning. They're they're hot all the time, but they're burning slow. So they're going to keep you intrigued, like, all right, you better pay attention. And you really got to pay attention so you don't miss something pivotal. And there's always, like, hidden little things everywhere. So there's probably some clue that, suit, like, pretty soon somebody's going to be like, they put it in front of us all the time. It was right there. <laughs> but so far, uh, I'm betting that, He's a central gathering hub. Like he's got everything. He's got the original code. He's got all the user data and DNA. Everything is embedded into Peter Abernathy. That's my bet. That's what I think. Ryan, Dolores talks about not only dominating this world, but their world. Is it possible that she knows the way out of Westworld? And do you think that the show will take us outside the parks? I doubt we'll see the real world. Um, at this season, unless it's like a teaser, you know, at the, you know, at the end of the season to tease, you know, next season. But, but I serious, you know, I, I feel like I don't know where they're going to go with this, which is one of the great things about this show is that, you know, often you, you watch a show, a season of a show and you, you can see where the story is going. This one, I mean, it, it was chaos at the end of last season who, you know, so now even now we're still not quite sure what's going on, but we kind of start to see, you know, there's a rebellion with, with the hosts and, you know, obviously they're going to be dealt with or attempted to deal with. So I'm assuming that most of the season will take place in the parks. And then depending on how that ends, maybe we do see them go into the real world. But I, but I doubt that that would make for a really interesting story because I just don't think they have the numbers and, and they're not in, they're not invulnerable so i don't see how like an army of a couple thousand hosts is going to do much damage to the real world unless there's you know something you know in, built into them or something in the park that, that i don't know so yeah my short answer no i don't see it the search team comes along an uncharted ocean and there's thousands of dead hosts floating in it ig do you hope that they show how this happened maybe some more background carnage of the night that the attack happened and how everything unfolded? Yeah, it almost looked like they were like committing suicide on themselves. Like, we're just going to go lay in this water that wasn't supposed to be there to begin with and just die, which I don't know. That's weird. I, I do want like a lot more backstory. Like they could go next week and just kind of run back to the beginning of like all of that happening. Like uh, we were seeing a pocket of what was happening during the host quote unquote uprising. Well, if that's happening there, what's happening with the rest of the host? Cause that's what, who these are. Right. So let's see what's going on. You know, they could just run back and kind of go backwards and see what's going on. I, I do want to see what's going on, but it's, it, it, I can only imagine being that, that rescue team and kind of freaking out seeing that. A little bit because uh, it's still got to be jarring, even though, you know, they're all robots. It's like, well, what happened to put thousands of them kind of right here, just laying lifeless? Why is there an ocean here and who put all these dead people in it? <laughs> Ryan Bernard states, I killed them all. And that looks like our good friend Teddy in the water. What were your thoughts and your ratings in the episode? Yes, yeah, so I, I thought this it was a really strong episode for for Westworld. I've been excited about the season. The most recent trailer kind of blew me away. 
Um, and you know, I was really happy with, really happy with, with how, kind of how things got started. I think, um, like I mentioned before, the, the challenge of the show is that basically everything, you know, was blown up and it was chaos. And so a lot of the intrigue was like, where are they going to go with this story? And so I, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued because it's not as linear as you would expect. You know, the initial thought is, okay, well, it's just going to be robots versus humans. And, you know, the, the, the trying to kind of take back the park but there's way more going on like who knows wh- why is Dolores killing other hosts why you know why did the all the hosts match you know drown in in in, in a sea that wasn't there you know um, how did that get there there's all these questions and it's so layered and so you know I think for this episode um you know, one of the strengths of the show is is when it takes a dive into kind of philosophy and kind of exploring the nature of consciousness, morality, um, you know, facing consequences, you know, when they don't exist. Um, and, I, you know, I think that while this episode was kind of heavy on some exposition and, and setting things up, I think it also started to explore these ideas um, and then also explore them in really interesting and u- unique ways, or at least set things up in, in really interesting and unique ways. Like, like I mentioned with, um, you know, if they're recording people's actions, you know, how does, you know, it, does it matter that you are a violent, sadistic person to robots? Um, what does that say about you? You know, there, there's some interesting questions that are coming up now beyond, you know, some of the many questions we had before. So I'm really excited about about that. So, um, you know, and again, all the performance was great. I mean, um, everyone from Ed Harris was awesome to Danny Newton to just to down, you know, across the board, um, except James Madison, who was just okay. Uh, across the board, the performances were <laughs> across the board. The performances were awesome. Um, and I really, I love the pairings. I think all the pairings, um, you know, the groups all play off each other really well. So, so I, you know, I think as a start to season, I'm really, really excited. Uh, easy 8.5, you know, we would give it more, but it's just, you know, it's setting things up. Um, but I'm really excited with this setup and how things are going. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So yeah, 8.5 is, is my score for this uh, episode one. This show is great, and it kind of came out of nowhere. The return was like, oh, we don't know when Workworld's coming back, and suddenly it's here, and I couldn't be happier about it. Listen, it's a complex show. There's a lot to digest every week. There's It's like an onion with plenty of layers, and by the end of it, you want to cry because you just don't know what the fuck's going on. I love the show. The twists, the turns, Dolores marching through that park had Empire Strikes Back feel to me. It just did. She was, she was Darth Vader on a mission. I thought it was great. I'm happy they're focusing on Bernard this season. Let's face it. Jeffrey Wright can straight up act. A new Terminator Dolores will give me nightmares for months. I can't wait to see what happens next. I can't wait for the next episode. I give A Journey Into the Night a nine and... Let's see what next week brings. So th- this episode to me is the epitome of what makes HBO the king. AMC is doing a great job with their shows and nobody can deny that. But if you line that line, anything AMC does up next to this show, I mean, especially visually, this is absolutely beautiful. Everything shot in this is just amazing to look at. Everything doing here is amazing to look at. And the acting, except for Cyclops, is through the damn roof. It is just great to watch. I, I can't wait for everything to happen. I can't say anything that the other guys didn't already say. It's so much fun to watch. And if you haven't checked it out, first of all, everybody's got HBO. And if you don't, find a friend who has HBO Go, log onto their account, and go watch the first season. It's there. Go watch it. You're going to enjoy it. It's crazy. But go see this. I'm going to give it a nine as well. And it was a lot of fun to watch. So now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's time for really. I'd explain it. Just listen. You'll get it. My really for the week goes out to Canelo Alvarez, who failed a PED test and is being suspended for six months, thus ruining the highly anticipated rematch with Triple G and really screwing up... um, you know, situation in boxing where the sport had really is really seeing a bit of a resurgence. And this fight was easily the most anticipated rematch of the last decade, maybe. And one of the most anticipated and highest level matches really you could put together 
without it being some kind of a freak show involving Conor McGregor. So it's really, really sad and frustrating that we're not going to get the rematch. Um, we're not going to get that fight. And in a lot of ways, it can set boxing back. So to Canelo Alvarez for really screwing over boxing and ruining what was really a highly anticipated fight. Really? Really, for me, this week goes out to the Testicle Festival in Clinton, Montana. Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen. The Testicle Festival has been called off. Mostly because last year... Two were killed and seven were injured. This festival has had a long line of problems, uh, drunken fights, nudity, debauchery, and your hugest fill of Rocky Mountain oysters you could possibly ever want. There's a long history going on here. 2005, a man was stabbed. In 2007, a man and a woman were stabbed. Showing this track record, I guess next year was the apocalypse. It was coming, and we know where it was going to start. Clinton, Montana. Why this is my really is I can't believe that it took 35 years of all this stuff going on for people to realize this might be a bad idea. So all of you that were looking forward to all the testicles you could possibly shove in your mouth, the Testicle Festival in Clinton, Montana. Really? My really this week goes out to director extraordinaire James Cameron. In a recent interview, he said he's praying for a little Avengers fatigue. Listen, I'm not here to slam James Cameron. He's a Hall of Famer. His work is great. But why make a statement like this? Could it be that these one-note superhero films that you're bashing are coming closer and closer to knocking you off the top of the box office mountain? Or maybe you're worried that one of the five sequels of Avatar that nobody is calling for might fall a little bit short. I'm not the type of person that would say something sucks simply because I don't like it or it doesn't vibe with me. But for the life of me, I cannot understand how Avatar has made as much money as it did. And I don't think it'll do it again. But to compare anything to The Godfather James is only going to let your fans down. There's only one. The landscape has changed, Mr. Cameron. Adapt or die. So for me this week, really, James Cameron? Really? And that's going to do it for this episode of The Cynic Radio Podcast. I'm Igri, and with me have been Cynic and Ryan. We had a great time talking about Fear the Walking Dead and Westworld. Next week, we'll be back with a bunch of other things, not the least of which is going to be Avengers Infinity War Part 1. We're really excited to be bringing that to you. Go ahead and share this with all your friends, family, and make sure that you continue to subscribe to The Cynic Radio Podcast. Send us all your questions, comments, and concerns to cynicradio at gmail.com. Find us on the internet at cynicradio.com. Look for us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cynicradio. And you can find us on Twitter at cynicradio. And until next time, don't get captured. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and at cynicradio.com. Available for download on iTunes. 